Good morning. Today we are going to continue our discussion. <laughs> continue our discussion of Flory Huggins theory, and uh, today we're going to show you how we arrive at a phase diagram. So, if you have a specific temperature and given intermolecular forces and a given uh, concentration of of one or the other uh, uh, component of the system, we'll get an idea for how they phase segregate. Ultimately, what we're going to arrive at is an expression for the, uh, for that, that shows how as you increase the degree of polymerization of two polymers in a mixture, then they absolutely don't want to phase segregate, or they, don't, they absolutely don't want to combine, they do phase segregate because there is significantly reduced entropic driving force for the polymer chains to come together. Okay, so let's look at the final result from last class. So we had this expression for delta G uh, mixing over RT. And it is equal to the, uh, the entropy of mixing x1 ln x1 plus x2 ln x2 plus x1 x2 times chi. And where we started, where we ended last class, we had a kt down here. And I changed it to rt because we're going to be talking about uh, per mole. KTs live in the land of molecules. So KT itself can be considered a unit of energy per molecule. So KT at room temperature has a value of 4 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. So that's minus 10, or 10 to the minus 20 something, you can think mole like individual molecules. Um, and, the, and RT has uh, a value of 2.5 joules per mole. So you're always talking about, if you see RTs, you're talking about moles of things. If you see KTs, you're talking about individual things. So moles are a lot more uh, convenient to, uh, to, to handle. So this is why we're going to develop our discussion in terms of, of moles, RT. OK, this part here is the, is the ideal entropy. And it promotes mixing. And is it, is it okay if I keep the discussion in terms of mole fractions right now? In 20 minutes, we'll switch to volume fractions when we're talking about polymers, but I just want to develop a discussion in terms of ideal entropy plus the regular enthalpy, which means that the intermolecular forces between 1 and 1 and 2 and 2 and 1 and 2 are, can be different, whereas in the ideal case, they're the same. So there's no enthalpy term yet. Because uh, we have KT, which has like X1, natural <coughs> log X1, but for RT, that's like we roll to N1 times natural log Except that we, we are saying that the G terms are per mole in this case, so that this thing is unitless no matter what. Because this is a fraction, this is natural log of a fraction, this is a fraction, this is a fraction, this is a fraction. So the ratio is going to be the same whether we're talking about molecules or moles of molecules. This is the ideal entropy, and it promotes, uh, promotes mixing. It's favorable, um, and it's, it's, the, it's the ideal entropy. For just the ideal solution, the only thing we have is entropy, right? The only thing we have is entropy. But for a regular solution, we have this enthalpy term. And what is chi? Chi is the Z delta W divided by KT, which is the fraction of, of the thermal energy KT that, we, that it costs us to exchange 
a molecule of, or to put a molecule of one into the environment of two and vice versa. So this is the non-zero enthalpy of mixing And we can also call it the contact dissimilarity. And it promotes separation. OK, so what do the phase equilibria for regular solutions uh, look like. If we break apart the delta G divided by RT term into two components, remember that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If we have minus delta S of mixing over R, just the entropy part, we have x1, natural log x1, plus x2, natural log x2. And our delta H of mixing term over RT is x1, x2, times chi. And we remember that chi need to differentiate it from x somehow. Big, big lazy x is z delta w over kt. We're not going to worry about the z, what the z's delta w's are again in the class. But we should know that it is proportional to 1, uh, one over t. So this is a unitless quantity. This is an energy divided by an energy. So let's plot the entropy minus delta S m over r from minus 1 to 0 on the y-axis, and the x-axis will be from 0 to 1, 0 0.5 in the middle, and this will be in x1. You could also do x2, because it's going to be symmetric for a regular solution. x1 equals 1 minus x2. And because there is no temperature dependence on the entropy, the ideal entropy always looks the same. <laughs> it's just a concave, uh, concave curve. The enthalpy, on the other hand, delta HM over RT from 0 to 1, again with the same units, has a dependence on temperature. It's still symmetric, but it has a dependence on temperature. So this curve at the bottom is the, is the high T curve, where chi equals 1.5, for example. And we have this other curve 
which is higher, but it actually represents a lower temperature where chi equals 2.5. Now, delta G, yeah? Could you just restate what's on the x-axis of the volume? The x-axis is the mole fraction, oh. x1. But it could also be x2 because it's symmetric. So delta G is just this plus this for different, for different chi's. Yeah. Is there a reason why uh, it's going from like zero to one for enthalpy and like zero to negative one for entropy? This is literally what you get if you plug in these volume fractions into the into the equation. Okay. You're always going to end up with a fraction. Yeah. We're using volume fractions now. Did I say volume fraction? If I did, I meant mole fraction. Okay. Mole fraction. X is mole fraction. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify earlier what we were just doing earlier. At the end of last, uh, this class's lecture, you defined the system, the total enthalpy, or not the total Gibbs free energy over RT, as the sum of several functions of N, and the KT uh, as several functions of X. At the beginning of this lecture, you signify the opposite. Was that a, you said something about them being equivalent, but you clearly defined them different last time? If this delta G is in units of energy per mole, then this is divided by RT gives you the fraction which equals the unitless quantity which equals all the stuff on the right. If delta G is in the change in free energy per site or per, per molecule and it's divided by KT, it's the exact same fraction, or it's the exact same unitless quantity. And it equals, again, the same stuff on the right. So the n versus x doesn't matter. The n versus x does matter. So uh, as an aside, we, we ended the discussion with uh, of the delta H of, uh, of mixing as being N1, N2 over N0, Z, delta W. where this is joules, N1. This, however, is X2. So we can say N1, X2, Z, delta W, over KT. And this we're going to call chi times KT gives you the expression N1 X2 chi K T and this is for the whole system. Whole system is the actual system because we have some number of molecules. Equivalently, if we were to multiply this by Avogadro's number over Avogadro's number, then we would have N1 over Avogadro's number times X2 chi. What's, what is K? What is the definition of K? What, how, do you, how do we arrive at it? The universal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number times T. So if we multiply by this, then we cancel this out, and this becomes the number of moles 
because this is the number of molecules divided by Avogadro's number gives you the number of moles. So this thing is equivalent to N1 X2 chi RT. There are two ways of saying whole system, but we're talking about KTs and numbers of molecules versus the whole system where we're talking about the number of moles and the number of joules per mole. So far, so good. You, this, this does not come easy, but it does take some manipulation of the R's and the K's, the big N's and the little N's. It depends on how we define G. Let me let me do a let me respond to this by by email. It depends on how we define G. If we plot delta G M over R T and we take this plus this, then we get a series of curves at high T I equals 1.5. Now at some critical chi, the curve becomes very flat in the center. We're adding this to this, and as we lower the t and increase the chi, then this and this create a region in the beginning that's very flat. And this is, uh, this is sort of medium temperature, but this is what we call the chi critical, which for regular solutions is always 2. And then if we lower the temperature any more, we get a bump here where the enthalpy starts to overwhelm the entropy. If we raise it even more, we get an obvious bump here. So let's say that this is low T chi equals 2.5. Now from the delta G curves, we can construct a diagram called a cloud point diagram. And we plot it in terms of T also versus the mole fraction X1. And we have one curve. that traces out the minima of the delta G curves as a function of, of temperature. Just trust me that this is the minimum of this plot. And we have another curve 
that traces out the inflection points where the concavity of this plot changes. Within this plot, and this is what we've been working for for the last three classes, we have this region above this whole curve that is the one phase region at sufficiently high temperatures everything dissolves one phase everywhere at sufficiently low temperatures everything separates so we have two phase down here The solid curve is called the binodal curve. The dashed curve is called the spinodal curve. This line happens to correspond to the temperature at which chi equals 2.5 but you could have different temperatures that correspond to different curves up here. As you build out, as you, as you sample the delta G at different temperatures and therefore different chi's, you reconstruct this curve. So this is the line corresponding to low T chi equals 2.5. The region on the, in the interior is called the unstable region where delta G is concave down everywhere within this region. And the region between the spinodal and the binodal curves are called, is called the, uh, the metastable region. And there is some critical temperature, Tc, also called the cloud point. And the cloud point means that if you lower the temperature below the cloud point, the solution becomes cloudy because things start to separate. That's literally why it's called that. The critical temperature occurs at a critical mole fraction which for regular solutions is always 0 0.5. And if you have some mole fraction and some given temperature and like pin the tail on a donkey, you end up here. Then your solution will want to separate toward the binodal. But in order to do that, it has to create two different phases, one which is enriched in x1 and another which is enriched in x2. This is a purely thermodynamic argument. It's not going to tell you how fast it gets there, or even if it does within geological timescales. But it tells you that that's the that's the thermodynamic driving force, is to get out of the unstable region toward the minima in delta G, which is, which is represented by the binodal curve. So for symmetric, 
curves, which all regular solutions have symmetric delta G curves. The binodal is, uh, is, the, is really the minima here, but if this were skewed, sometimes you might, see it, you might see a skewed for an irregular solution, then technically the binodal will be the intersection of the double tangent. Don't worry about it. I just want to say that, strictly speaking, it's not always the minima, but for regular solutions, it is. OK, let's introduce now the, uh, the fact that X2, which is a solvent here, is going to be now a polymer. OK, for uh, regular polymer solutions, The number of segments R breaks the symmetry of the S, um, of the S curve. And you get an asymmetric phase diagram. So the uh, Flory Huggins entropy, delta S M equals minus K times N1 natural log phi 1 plus N2 natural log phi 2 for the whole system. of N1 plus N2 molecules. But for the, uh, for the, uh, for the whole, uh, or for, per site, so to obtain delta SM per site, divide by n naught equals n1 plus r n2. So you have delta s equals minus k times n1 over n naught natural log phi1 plus n2 over n naught natural log phi2. OK. N1, which is the solvent, divided by the number, N1, which refers to the number of sites occupied by the solvent, divided by the total number of sites, is the volume fraction, phi1. Someday I'll figure out how to draw lowercase k. Phi1 natural log phi1. But is N2 divided by N not just phi2? It's not. It's not. It's not, right? Because N2 over N1 plus R N2 equals phi2 over r, because phi2 equaled r times n2 over n1 plus r n2. So this guy is really phi2 over r, and this is where, the, uh, this is where it all hits the fan. Because this produces the asymmetry. Yeah. So in phi1, phi1 is the solvent. So if you just take, so in the case of n1 over n1 plus rn2, 
that's just the definition of phi one because this is the number of sites occupied by the solvent molecules or number of solvent molecules divided by the total number of sites and that's just the volume fraction whereas this the definition of the volume fraction of um, uh, of of the polymer was the number of segments <coughs> times the number of sites occupied by polymer monomers so the number of of uh, basically the number of um, number of polymer chains times r gives you the total number of sites occupied by polymer chains divided by the total number of sites eventually i did say that correctly <laughs> yeah Regular meaning when we have uh, what, V1 and V2 both being polymers, or is that when we have had a solvent in a polymer? So, uh, a regular solution which has only configurate a regular a regular solution has the ideal entropy, so just configurational entropy only, plus some unfavorable enthalpy term. A regular solution in which one of the components is a polymer has this, it's still just the configurational entropy, but now you are, now since your polymer has some number of repeat units, R, the, vo the, the definition of the volume fraction, or the volume fraction has to be reduced by the number of, uh, of units of monomer units are because they they can only move together in the solution. So thus far we're still talking about one one object is the polymer, one object is the solvent, but we're gonna segue into two, two polymers. Eventually we will we will segue into two polymers, but right now it's just solvent one and polymer two. Okay, so the total delta G is kt times phi 1 natural log phi 1 plus phi 2 r natural log phi 2 plus phi 1 phi 2 chi Per site, where this term is the source of the asymmetry, and we can see that if we increase R, so we increase the degrees of polymer, the degrees of polymerization, then this term will eventually go to zero, and the only favorable driving force for the dissolution is only the increased configurational entropy of the solvent molecules, not the polymer. So what do these cloud point diagrams for polymers look like? So let's go, I don't know what polymer this is, 320, 300, 323, 40, 360, 380, 400. And we will plot this in terms of phi 2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. 
3. And because of the asymmetry of the entropy term, you can see that compared to the regular solution without a polymer present, this curve, these curves are going to be way shifted to the left. And what they look like is something like where this equals r x sub n of 100, where we're now saying, because these are real data for a real system, with a real x sub n, we'll just call it the average degree of polymerization, the number average degree of polymerization, whereas r was, was the number of connected checkers in a checkerboard. But really, they're, they, they're intended to be the same thing. And this is for x sub n equals 300. And as we as we increase the degree of polymerization, our phase diagram shifts more and more to, uh, to the left. There will be some temperature where this effect will saturate, and we call this theta, the theta temperature. Which is the critical temperature in a given polymer solvent system for uh, infinite molecular weight. Infinite molecular weight, or x sub n, or r. So the polymer becomes freaking gigantic, this curve is going to shift all the way up here, where the critical point will now approach the, uh, the, uh, the, the theta temperature. OK, so what are, uh, what are some, uh, some consequences? And look at page 271 for the derivation. But the critical volume fraction, so this is the volume fraction uh, where the critical point occurs for a given r or x sub n equals 1 over the square root of r or 1 over the square root of x sub n. And the critical, uh, the critical chi is 1 half plus 1 over the square root of x sub n plus 1 over 2 x sub n. So as r equals x sub n goes to infinity, chi critical goes to 1 half. And remember, Uh, 
for two solvents, so all this crap over here, we had chi critical equals two and theta or phi critical or x sub one or x sub two critical because they're a symmetric diagram was always equal to one half. So we get some fairly obvious uh, predictions from this as well as r equals x sub n increases phi 2 critical moves towards solutions dilute in polymer And finally, for a given Z delta W, the critical temperature increases as R equals X sub N increases. So I want to say some qualitative things about what happens when number one is also a polymer. Richard, yep. Is R normally correlated with X sub N like on a regular basis? Because I don't put by X sub N is just average to your polymerization. And R is just Right. So in a so in the mathematical system, in the Flory Huggins world where we're just talking about spots on a checkerboard or a 2D or a 3D lattice. R is just the number of linked cells. And there's no, we, there's no polydispersity in R. It's just always one number. X sub N is for a real system that allows some dispersity. But for our what I'm trying to do here is just get us back to reality. So translating from Flory Huggins theory where R was just consecutive spots on a checkerboard, or they don't actually, it didn't, didn't even assume that they were consecutive spots on a checkerboard, but, but uh, they're, they're spots that are linked in some way. So this is kind of the mathematical construction and this is, this is reality where there will be some, some dispersity in the system. Okay, what about polymer-polymer mixtures? Delta S M will now be proportional to phi one over R one natural log phi one plus phi2 over r2, natural log phi2. So both 1 and 2 are polymers. And the consequence is that as As R1 equals R2 approaches infinity, delta S M goes to zero. So enthalpic unfavorability is all that contributes to polymer mixing. And actually it doesn't contributes to poly polymer mixing, it completely 
disallows polymer mixing because it's positive. So let's say an enthalpic unfavorability prevents prevents mixing. Let's do a little uh, thought experiment. Let's think about a two by two lattice. with n uh, number of sites equal to 4. For an ideal solution, we had something like this, where we had six distinguishable microstates for two objects of each type. So our omega equals uh, 6. But now let's say that the filled circles are now dimers. Filled circles are now basically polymers, but the simplest possible polymers where they're just, they're just dimers. So will polymerize them. Eh, 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 eh. We don't have any down here because we can't, uh, there are no, the diagonal configurations are not available. So we can see how Constricting the system so that the polymer monomers are sitting in cells next to each other constricts the um, uh, constricts the available uh, the available sites. So we can polymerize these two uh, as well. But those are the only configurations that they can exist in. Okay. Now, what if you have a huge number of sites? So this is for a small number of sites. We now have omega equals 4. But what about for n not equals 100? And we'll look at two different scenarios, one where one where we have only, uh, only monomers. R1 equals R2 equals 1 and n1 equals n2 equals 50 each. 50 plus 50, 100. Our total number of distinguishable microstates is 10 to the 30. But if we just polymerize them to 10 mers, so r1 equals r2 equals 10, and n1 equals n2 equals 5, so 10 so five chains of each times 10 monomers each. Our omega takes a nosedive. The number of distinguishable microstates is now 10 to the 3. So we've lost 27 orders of magnitude in configurational microstates by linking these up only just a little bit, just to 10. And this, is, this really drives home the point that the entropy of mixing goes way down for any appreciable molecular weight. And that's going to control all of polymer phase behavior. And we will do wrap-up duty, mop-up duty, uh, on Friday and make sure that we address all of the confused phases. And, uh, and introduce just one or two other topics, and then we'll be done with thermodynamics. Thank you.